this scenario, assume that you're elected president of the United States, you're sitting in the Oval Office, can you see yourself signing uh, a bill or a directive abolishing the Federal Reserve? Well, a lot would have to happen, you know, if, um, if I went there and I was a libertarian president and the Congress remained the same and the spending was continuing and the people still wanted all this big government, no, I can't, I can't sign a bill because it wouldn't have been passed. Uh, in the first four years of a libertarian administration, I don't think we're going to achieve that unless we're picking up the pieces, <laughs> you know, and I don't want that to happen. I'd like to avoid the chaos, and that's uh, my goal. But if there's, if there's an economic calamity and they look to the libertarians for solutions, then I think it's conceivable. But that would be more like being a prophet than uh, somebody running for president, you know. And, and I just don't know how this happened, will happen. Uh, but I do believe, though, if we continue to do what we're doing, continue to spend, run up the deficit, print the money, uh, I think we are going to have the crisis. But uh, right now, I'm f terrified to think that the people in Washington aren't going to look to us for the answers. They're going to enforce these uh, emergency powers, and FEMA will be in, co in control, uh, not the American people. Can you, uh, d did your committee uh, look into the matter of the uh, debt which foreign countries owe to the so-called U.S. banks? Yes, that's been and ongoing and certainly 1982 was a key year because there was a big bailout of Mexico and Argentina and Brazil in order to patch it together. And uh, they did everything illegal, just like it was illegally done, even admitted by Don Regan, who was Secretary of Treasury at the time. It was illegal on how they bailed out Continental of Illinois. And uh, they do whatever is necessary to keep the structure together, the system together. If big banks gobble up little banks, but nothing disintegrates. It's not like what was happening in the 1920s, 1930s. And uh, they'll do whatever is necessary. So that's what happened back in 1982. They work internationally, too. The Federal Reserve, the Treasury, the World Bank, Bank of International Settlements, which is the depositor for all the central banks. See, you have the Federal Reserve banks depositing in the Federal Reserve System, but the central banks of the United States and all the other countries use the Bank of International Settlements in Switzerland to be the International's Bankers Bank. And they all got involved to keep the structure together, and they did. They restored order. That was back when gold went quickly from $300 up to $500 within a six-month period. But then they saw the, the market decide, oh, it looks like they're going to hold it together for a while longer, and they certainly have, at the expense of the American taxpayer and at the expense of the dollar. And of course, since then, the dollar's value has gone down 40, 50 percent in value of other currency. Prices continue to rise. But eventually, my argument is that the marketplace will overwhelm even those men of great power, and there will be a panic that the bankers won't be able to maintain. And then they will want to maintain their power, but not by, not by fine tuning the economy, but then by the intimidation of political force. Uh I noticed a very little talked about thing that, uh, this is from the alternative press, where uh, the head of the Fed, Paul Volcker, got a little bill or a little sentence on a rider on a bill passed through Congress that if necessary, the foreign debt of these uh, third world countries to the U.S. banks would be monetarized, which is just a way of saying that the U.S. taxpayers would pay for it. Yes, this was part of that Monetary Control Act, and that means that if uh, the Fed can hold any asset, they can hold a foreign bond. They literally, under the law today, can buy a Mexican bond that's worthless, put it in the Federal Reserve, and then what monetize means is that it can be collateral for issuing credit issuing Federal Reserve notes, and that will be considered an asset probably at face value. They're not going to deep, I mean, the bond isn't going to be worth anything, obviously, but they can monetize that. That is mean they will take it as an asset, create new money, and distribute the new money. Hmm. So that isn't a direct bailout by the taxpayers? It's an, in, it's probably, it's an indirect because what we do is we buy the Mexican bond and then put the bond uh, in the Federal Reserve. But actually, it, it works twice because let's say the Mexican bond, there's a billion dollars worth of Mexican bonds down there. So the Fed says, well, we'll buy them. You need some hard cash. We'll buy your bond from you, and we give them the money, and they take that out of, out of the system, and they send it to them. But then when they take it, it's an asset. It becomes an asset to the Federal Reserve, and they say, ah, oh, we have something we can back up our currency with. <laughs> so they take this worthless instrument that they paid for with fiat money, and then they put it in their assets, and then they create, use that to create more money. So they really monetize it twice, so to speak. 
How closely tied is the Federal Reserve System and the U.S. banking system with the European banking system, the Rothschilds, et cetera? The international bankers are buddies, you know, and they're, they're closer together and they deal with policy outside most of the legislative institutions. Uh, the central bankers are more powerful than, say, the uh, congresses of the different countries. Uh, they have much more power, and therefore, through the Bank of International Settlement and the IMF and the World Bank, they have total control of this, and they have meetings where even the Secretary of the Treasury doesn't attend. It's strictly the bankers, the Federal Reserve and the Bundestag and all the other banks of the world. They get together and they make these plans and that's why they come up with the bailout systems, you know, if there's a banking crisis someplace. But uh, they, they will uh, do whatever they think is necessary by the creation of new credit. Right now they have made the agreement that they will create more of these special drawing rights, which is nothing more than credit instruments in the IMF. They create them out of thin air. They have a monetary value in all, based in all currencies, and they can give those to whomever needs them. And uh, they've just agreed to cre create $40 billion worth of new special drawing rights out of thin air. Now, what then is the role of the IMF? It seems to me that the taxpayers' money goes to the IMF, they give it to the third world country, which in turn turns it back over to the banks. It looks like a... In, and a lot in of it just bail. goes directly from, uh, you know, the taxpayers directly to the bank. It never goes to the third world. It's all oh. by computer. <laughs> but that was, you know, a few years back, I guess it was 83, there was an IMF bailout. They were in financial trouble and it was $9 billion. Most of that money was necessary to pay interest, you know, just to the big banks. That's why the Panama Canal Treaty existed. Uh, it was a banking deal, too. It was uh, Panama was having trouble making their payments to the banks, and they needed a better cash flow. The Canal Treaty occurred. They had more income. Now their uh, little or, old uh, Noriega isn't quite so obedient, and they're a little bit annoyed by it all. But, uh, you know, Trujillos and then Noriega were really the hand-picked people from our business banking industry. They had a banking haven down there. But now Noriega isn't uh, quite so obedient. It's making the bankers a little nervous. They'd like to get rid of them, and so far they haven't been able to. And I think one of the reasons is he has a lot of, he has a lot of information that he is threatened with. And they said, if you ever get too close to us, we're going to let the world know exactly uh, how you've been dealing with us and subsidizing our drug trade. So I think he's doing a little blackmail. People who've studied the drug trade say that if we're not for the collusion and uh, facilitation and laundering of money by the big banks, the drug trade wouldn't be able to operate. They'd have a great deal of difficulty because uh, they literally end up buying some of these banks and they own the banks and, and they do, uh, you know, filter their money through. Now there's a great pretense that there's going to be a lot of crackdown on all these drug dealers and this money coming into that and they're going to find out who it is. <laughs> but I think that's basically designed to use as an excuse, develop this hysteria against drugs so that they have currency controls on whom? On American citizens who finally wise up and say, hey, I can't preserve my wealth in this country. I'm going to put a couple of Krugerrands over in, the, over in the Swiss banks. So they try to take everybody, when near the time of runaway inflation, people want to take the money out of the country to preserve their wealth. And that's why they're doing, writing all these laws not to catch the drug dealers. I think that's just a, you know, a, a, you know, a front. I think the real reason is to have currency controls on the American citizens because once a large number of citizens decide to leave, just think of how many people in Mexico tried to come here when their banking crisis occurred. You know, the government clamped down. You can't take the money out. They still did. But we, we had those, uh, we had credit controls in the 1970s, currency controls, trying to keep people. Britain had them on, off and on, and they'll all, they always resort to those kind of things. Uh, so we can anticipate it, but I think that's one of the uh, purposes of the big drug issue is order to write these laws so that they control innocent American people who would like to preserve their wealth. But they could clamp, they could do away with the dope trade pretty fast if they really clamp down on the big banks, but they're the head people in the power structure. Th that's right, but they're not likely to do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, John, you've uh, taken a look at foreign investment in the United States. Some of those statistics, haven't you? It's startling when you, when you look at it all in one lump sum. Uh, Ron, you're from Houston, and there was a, 
uh, story recently about Houston uh, prime real estate there being about 36 percent foreign owned uh, that occurred in USA Today a front page story uh, prime real estate in Los Angeles 49 percent 46 percent something like that foreign owned we're seeing uh, uh, investments every day, banks being bought, uh, commercial properties, farmland, and the article that I saw, there was a study released last month on it that it's the foreign investment total in the United States now is in excess of $1.3 trillion and growing uh, at a tremendous rate. Uh, we call it the liquidation sale of America. <laughs> Why is it happening? Uh, there are several reasons why it's happening, but I think in, a lot of those investments are made by uh, Japanese. Japanese investors. I think it's rather interesting to note that we had to fight a war not too many years ago with Japan. We, we thought we won the war and now they own not only uh, a lot of Houston and Los Angeles, they own Waikiki Beach. They won uh, uh, due to our bad policy what they couldn't win in war. <clears throat> The main reason is it's, it's our sick currency. We have a balance of trade problem but we compound it by literally exporting a lot of our money through foreign aid and military aid. So even Japan gets a benefit of $50 billion a year by us paying for all their national defense. So we sort of subsidize them and uh, because we're less competitive and our interest rates are high. Uh, our interest rates are 8 and 9% and Japan are 2 and 3%. Uh, labor costs are lower so we can't compete anymore and that's why we keep buying Japanese products. A lot of people say, well, the only solution is is to write a law and say that Americans can't buy a Japanese car and no foreign investors allowed to invest in this country. We as libertarians don't accept that. It's treating the symptom rather than the disease. The disease is a foreign policy where we subsidize these rich allies. At the same time, we have a currency that's weak and we have economic conditions that have made us non-competitive. We don't want to take away the right of the individual to buy whatever product he wants and we don't want to start some type of walling off of our country and saying nobody can come and go and people can't come in. I want a right to go out of the country and invest and that means we have to allow somebody else to come in here and invest. So our solution is free markets, sound money, low interest rates, competitiveness, free market prices in labor, quit subsidizing Japan, a different foreign policy, then I don't think we'd have to worry. We never had to worry about the foreigners buying up this country until recent times, until, <clears throat> until we got into these economic problems. But it's, it's curious to people who say we shouldn't uh, f uh, keep financing the defense of Western Europe and Japan, and yet it's those people who are buying American securities and financing our deficits. So they are the indirectly, foreigners. Yeah, so they are indirectly uh, paying for their own defense. You know, there is there's some truth to that, and uh, I think there's a been a deal too. I think that sometimes they're buying our debt when it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But you have to think about again of this internationalism. Uh, they do this in order to maintain their order for their benefit. So even if it isn't to Japan's central bank's interest, you know, to buy our securities uh, for a strict economic, they might be able to buy somebody else's security and make more money. Uh, they might be able to buy a Swiss security, it might be a better deal. But if it's best for order, uh, in their eyes, I think yes, they will. And indirectly that is the case. So. I think long term, we can't pay this debt. So if we owe Japan a trillion dollars, if they bought a trillion dollars worth of our treasury bills, I think they're going to be left holding the bag. That's when I think the panic's going to come. When it finally dawns on them that they're holding a lot of lousy debt and they quit buying our debt, that'll be the precipitating event for the crisis. And that's when the, then the cartel, you know, this is a cartel of central banks, uh, and they're working pretty well together, and there's a lot of power there. But I think they'll finally break up their little cartel, and they'll get uh, a little bit antsy, and uh, they won't buy our debt, and then the panic will start. Isn't there a potential problem with the buying up of so much U.S. industry and banks and land? And that is, it's with ownership comes control and power. So are we, through letting them do this, actually giving the Japanese more and more power over our economic oh, and political so. system? That's why we should change our policy. That's why we should have sound money. I think it's very dangerous because uh, <clears throat> we literally will lose control. And uh, that's why I think it's urgent that we look to balancing a budget as quickly as possible and restoring sound money and changing our foreign policy. But the if we're concerned, which I think everybody is, I don't think anybody is unconcerned, I think some people come up with different solutions, but I want to not deal with it in the narrow sense or probably writing some little 
rigid rule and say, well, I can solve this if we just keep Japan's cars out of here. <laughs> We're going to solve our problem. It's not that easy. I mean, we have to look at the big picture of the economy, the monetary system, the deficits, uh, the whole thing put together in order to solve it. It means it's not easy. Well, thank you for sharing your time with us. Thank you. And your, your background and insight. And uh, we all got to look for some place to go when that big crash occurs. I don't know where it's going to be, but... Uh, we got to prepare ourselves. Maybe we all got to start studying Japanese. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> you know, it's very interesting. Back when I was in high school and college, they'd always say, well... There are basically three types of liberal, uh, people, uh, political attitudes. There are the liberals who want to make changes. Then there are conservatives who want to keep the things the way they are. And then there are the reactionaries, and they want to go back and do away with all the things that have been built up in the present and go back to an earlier age. And so this term reactionary was used a lot, and it was, you know, a bad, bad name. Nobody wanted to be in a reactionary. This was a label that was penned on Goldwater, and one of the things, you know, contributing to his demise, I'm sure, but they never say anything about Reagan being a reactionary, do they? And yet Reagan that's exactly is a uh, what he revolutionary is. reactionary. A new yeah. uh, category has to come in for uh, him. In fact, <laughs> the greatest distribution of wealth in American history took place under Ronald uh, Reagan. Literally billions of dollars were redistributed from the poor and the middle classes to the rich through Reagan's uh, tax bank program, his building up the arms industry, his government subsidized subsidies for different uh, corporations, et cetera, making class divisions much uh, greater under the Reagan administration than previously had ever happened in recent American uh, history. This really blows away the theory that liberals were advancing, that we're moving towards a classless society <laughs> in which class divisions between the rich and the poor are uh, disappearing in the uh, United States, at least during the Reagan administration. The uh, class differences have spectacularly uh, grown, as has the growth of a new underclass. I mean, there's even a worse situation than uh, poor working uh, people, and that is all the homeless, all of the uh, underclass that doesn't have any job, home, or even hope of any employment uh, whatsoever that has, again, mushroomed spectacularly under the Reagan administration, has visitors to any city in the United States can see. That's the end of another Alternative Views. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. Goodbye.